My name is Amy Rowe and I am the Executive Director of the Fulton County Chamber of Commerce and on behalf of the Fulton County Chamber of Commerce and the Fulton County Farm Bureau, we wanted to say thank you. I'm looking at this crowd and I am so amazed at how many folks came out. I think it was seven degrees when I looked at um, my car temperature, so it was four. A representative friends telling me it's four degrees. So. In South Carolina, nobody would have come out. So I was panicking this morning when I was here at 645. I thought, no one's coming out. I just know they're not going to. And at 650, we had our first guest. So uh, thank you so much for coming out in droves to support us and to learn a little bit more about the legislative process. I wanted to um, have Miss Phyllis Biddinger, if she could come up here really quickly. We're going to allow her to do the welcome. We just appreciate so much what we have in Fulton County. We have two uh, chair folks who do such a great job. I had know both Chad and Phyllis personally. And I just had a, a, an amazing conversation with Chad yesterday in my office. And I respect the two of them in ways that um, I did not before when I was younger. So I just understand that they're so respectful of each other, and I wanted to let her do the welcome in honor of the work that she does. Good morning. My name's Phyllis Bittinger, and I'm Fulton County Democrat Chair. And I would like to thank the Chamber of Commerce and um, their director, Amy Rowe, and the Farm Bureau and their director, Jennifer Richter, for sponsoring this legislative breakfast this morning. Also, a big thank you goes out to Link and Lisa Townsend for opening up this facility to us. I have a big welcome to you, the U.S. citizens, the Hoosiers, the Fulton County voters, the elected officials, and the candidates who care enough to come out on this cold Saturday morning to take an interest in our government. When I took the job as Democrat chair about two years ago, Chad Hartzler, the Republican chairman, and he's in the audience, I don't know where he's at, but he's on, there he is. And uh, Chad and I agreed that we would not fight or be nasty to each other. <laughs> we agreed that we would work together on issues that affected both parties and be respectful and civil mannered. We have known each other for a long, long time and we know that each of one of us wants the best for our community, our country, our state, and our county. So Washington, watch how the Democrats and Republicans do it here in Fulton County, Indiana. I must add, we never promised that we wouldn't compete die heartedly. A warm welcome to our state senators, to our state senator, Randy Head. There's Randy. And congratulations on your candidacy as an attorney general. Thank you. And welcome to our representatives, Bill Friend, Tim, ha Tim Harmon, and Doug Gutwin. We appreciate your willingness to come and share your knowledge and positions on the bills with us. Before I end, I want to ask you all a question. Do you have a date for Valentine's Day? It is February the 14th. And that's tomorrow. So I wish each one of you a very happy Valentine's Day, and thank you, and uh, enjoy the meeting. Good morning and welcome. I am Jennifer Richter, the president of Fulton County Farm Bureau. And I would also like to thank our legislators for being here this morning. It's always a nice opportunity for Fulton County to receive an update on the bills they are working on and to be able to ask questions. I'd like to recognize a few people that are here this morning. We have Michelle Livinghouse, who is running on the Democrat side for District 17 State Representative. Welcome. Welcome. 
We also have Lynn Coleman, who is running on the Democrat side for District 2, U.S. Congressman. <laughs> we have Jesse Bohannon here. He's running um, on the Republican ticket for District 17, State Representative. <laughs> I'd like to recognize a few of our Farm Bureau uh, members. We have our regional manager, John Newsom. Welcome. We have our District 1 Education and Outreach Coordinator, Deb Walsh. A few of our local board members, we have David Summers. We have Stephen Williams. And we also have two of our FFA uh, representatives, Trey Downauer and Blake Richter. And with that, our FFA kids who are here, I'm going to recognize the other two, Nicole Ranstead and Josh Miller, and they're going to come forward and lead us in the pledge. thing before we get started we have several of our county um, candidates here this morning if you are running for a, a county or city office if you could just stand for a moment so people can can see you all excuse me oh, okay thank you very much and I'm going to go ahead and turn the program over to our legislators. I'm not sure if you would like to come forward, um, however you want to go, whichever order you want to go in, and uh, start with the update. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, the state reps always pick me to go first, so that if anyone's angry for any reason, they'll get mad at the first guy. <laughs> Am I wrong? I don't see any objections over here. All right. Uh, thank you so much for being here. I'm told that every time I come to Fulton County, I say, wow, what a great crowd. I'm going to say it again. Wow, what an incredible crowd you guys have. Uh, and it's always the case. And I think uh, Farm Bureau and uh, the Chamber partnering together has been a wonderful thing for both entities. And we get more people here uh, than we would have if just either one of them had done it separately. And the biggest crowds that I get anywhere in the six counties that I represent. Uh, and today's no exception. I think it's fantastic. I want to take a moment to, uh, to recognize Ted Wagner and your, uh, your bid to become our next Supreme Court Justice. Congratulations to you. That, that application is really short, right? Just a couple of pages? I, several years ago, applied for a position on the Court of Appeals and had no idea until I got into it. But it's, uh, you know, in high school when the teacher says write a 10-page paper, you think that's a lot. Usually these are about 100 pages, correct? And, uh, so uh, congratulations to you for, for going through that work and putting yourself out there. Has your interview been scheduled yet? Yes, next Friday. Next Friday. Okay. Uh, I'll give you some tips. Of course, I didn't make it, so yeah, I'll tell you what not to do. <laughs> I, I found when I went through that process that if you had dealt with people in your career, you had a distinct advantage in the interview process. I remember when I finished my interview, just as Shepard walked me out, and there was what I call a library lawyer waiting to go next. This guy had never been in front of a jury in his life, and I could tell because I thought his knees were knocking together. And just as Shepard stopped me and grabbed him and said, look, here's the guy we just got done with. He lived. He'll be okay. That's how visibly nervous that guy was. <laughs> so uh, the fact, Ted, that, that you've dealt with people uh, and made that the, the cornerstone of your career is, uh, is going to help you, and I think you're, you're going to do just fine. Because you were probably suffering for lack of confidence anyway, right? Seriously, though, this is a good thing for this community that you're doing that. Uh, I had called uh, earlier the, the chamber in Farm Bureau to say I didn't think I was going to be able to be here today. Uh, and as you heard, I'm putting in my name to run for Attorney General, and I was at the Vanderburg County Lincoln Day last night. Uh, and I thought that I would drive down uh, and get a room because I fall asleep after 9 o'clock, uh, and it wouldn't be safe for me to drive back by myself. And Ethan Manning here, the Miami County Republican Chairman, who's working on my campaign, uh, says, you know what, Randy, I'll drive you down, and we'll drive back the same night. I said, that's great. So we left at 3 p.m. yesterday. Uh, we got back about 2.30 a.m. 
Uh, and in my driveway this morning, Ethan said, I'll see you in five and a half hours at Rochester. <laughs> so how can you say no to that? <laughs> All right. Uh, and I, just a tip, if Ethan ever drives you anywhere, have him adjust the seats, okay, before he leaves your car. Stand up, Ethan. <laughs> That'll take a while. Okay. I got in my car this morning. I felt like a kid in a car seat. I couldn't touch the wheel. I couldn't touch the pedals. <laughs> All right. Our, well, our, our first third house session uh, was in Akron, and we talked an awful lot then uh, about methamphetamine and about roads. Uh, so I'm going to start with those two topics, uh, and, and then I'll turn it over. Uh, if you're from the Citizens Action Committee, stand up. Come on, guys. Don't be shy. Stand up. Okay. All right. You've been standing up for this community. Whoa. Standing up for this community since you got started, so there should be no shame in standing up here today. Uh, where we are with the bill is that we passed the Senate with flying colors 41 to 8. Uh, and this is the bill that, that is based entirely on the, the project that works here in Fulton County, which is having a pharmacist ask someone who wants cold medicine uh, a few questions, have a consultation with them, and determine if there's a, a medical uh, for pseudoephedrine. All right, and all of you know that pseudoephedrines are a raw material. It's a key ingredient in methamphetamine, and you can't make it the way they make it here in Indiana without pseudoephedrine. Uh, and I've, you know, I've had a public defender who lives in my district come and grab me and say this meth registry does not work. It's very simple. Everyone just hires someone else to go buy the legal limit of pseudoephedrine. They make as much meth as they want. And we've led the country uh, for three years in meth lab arrests. Now, I actually had someone on the floor of the Senate tell me, well, this must mean the system works. I say, well, no, if we're the national leader three years running, that means it's an abysmal failure. <laughs> uh, and we've got to do something. And we have to do the right thing. Uh, and I applaud uh, the committee. Uh, because you uh, got tired of waiting on the legislature and took matters into your own hands that have made a huge difference in this community. You've uh, stopped pseudo sales around 50%. You've dropped it. And you did it. We didn't do it. You did it. Uh, and that's fantastic. And it's wonderful to be able to go to my colleagues in the House and in the Senate on both sides of the aisle and say, this isn't some theory that someone came up with. This is something that's already working right now, today, in a community that I represent. Uh, so our discussions have been very short because, by and large, they recognize that this is the way to go. Uh, the House bill uh, also passed uh, and had very few no votes, uh, and it is more detailed than my bill. My bill leaves it up to the Board of Pharmacy to determine the rules and procedures. Uh, that bill has very specific rules and procedures in it already, uh, and it uh, was written by Representative Ben Smaltz, who's done a fantastic job. Uh, we heard uh, my bill in the House the very first week that we could do that last week, uh, and I thought the hearing went rather well. Harry came and testified, and Harry, you always do a good job. Uh, we had... Uh, some big chain pharmacies, uh, and also a, a lobbyist uh, hired by the pill makers, the makers of pseudoephedrine, the six companies who make it. They fly him all around the country uh, to fight any bill that might, uh, that might reduce their sales. And both of them testified, and they said, you know, it's not fair to a pharmacist to put him in this position. Then we had the representative of the Indiana Pharmacist Association stand up and say, we support this bill 100 percent. Pharmacists can do this. Uh, let, us, let us give this a try. This is not a, a stretch and we can help stop the meth lab problem. Uh, and Harry and I had a hard time not giggling out loud because it was a, it was a great moment. Uh, the questions from the committee members uh, to the people who were opposed to the bill I thought were very pointed and demonstrated that they've been educated very well and have a good knowledge about how the system works and where the failings are in our meth registry system and why we have to improve it. Uh, the, the lobbyist for the, the pill makers said 49 other states have rejected this approach. Uh, well, there's a pharmacist in the House of Representatives who happens to be on the committee, and he stopped him and said, wait, 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 tell me what you mean. Well, what I mean is 49 other states haven't done this. They didn't consider it. They didn't uh, think about it and reject it. Uh, the, the gentleman had, had gone a bit too far, and Representative Davison called him on it. Uh, so we're going to vote on that bill Wednesday. Uh, I expect uh, that that bill will pass committee. I expect it will go to conference committee where we'll make some final changes to it. I'm working with Representative Smaltz. And even though we have different bills, we're on the same team. We've had several conversations. We feel the exact same about uh, what has to happen. And neither one of us care whose bill is the one that gets passed. Uh, what we care about is what's in that bill. And we're working together to try to create uh, the best product possible. And it may be just be an example of, a, uh, of how the legislature ought to work all the time. And really, it works this way more than you know, uh, more than you would think. Now, I'm sure that we're going to get some bumps in the road uh, because uh, the pill makers are putting on a full court press. Uh, they're running radio ads all over the state. Uh, they're calling people at home and telling them to call us. I get emails every day that say, oppose this prescription requirement. And I say, read the bill. 
It's not a prescription requirement. We're, we're bending over backwards to make sure that you don't have to go to your doctor and wait in line, pay your deductible, pay your copay, just to go get cold medicine. That's why we've written the bill the way that we have. So you don't have to have a prescription requirement. And of course, almost everyone who calls my office to complain about the bill has somehow, some way, been given the impression that pseudoephedrine is now out in the store and that we're putting it behind the counter and that'd be a bad thing. It's been behind the, behind the counter for years. Uh, so I say to the pill makers, if you have to run deceptive advertising to try to protect your market share, you might be part of the meth problem in Indiana. Uh, we know uh, on Monday uh, a bunch of lobbyists came to testify who were never involved in that conflict before. So I know that the pill makers have hired at least two lobbying firms. One of the big chain pharmacies has hired another one. Uh, there are probably more have been hired than I realize, and they're going to put on a full court press to try to stop this uh, because they like the system the way that it currently is. Uh, I've met with uh, some representatives of some big chain pharmacies, and they were very professional and very polite. Uh, and I don't want to give any other impression. But what they wanted was an amendment that says instead of the pharmacist shall consult with people and shall determine if they get the pseudoephedrine or not, uh, that they may if they want to. They say, you know, it's just a little amendment. It just changes one word. Well, it, it guts the entire bill. Uh, and we had a, a productive and professional conversation, but I, I told them on that point, I absolutely would not budge. Not today, not tomorrow, not ever. There would be no point in a bill that says a pharmacist can do that if they want to because the law already says they can't. That would, that would just be spinning our wheels and achieving nothing. We, we have to take a step here, a huge step and the right step to address methamphetamine in Indiana. And I'll close up by simply saying this bill is so fantastic. I tell everyone I wish it had been my idea. Uh, but it wasn't. It was you guys, and you've, you've done fantastic things. We're going to continue to work together. We're going to press forward. Uh, when we met last time in Akron, uh, a couple of road funding bills were moving, uh, and, and they're still moving. They all passed, <clears throat> and we've got the short-term fix and a couple of proposals for long-term fixes. Uh, the short-term fix releases money the state was holding that, that was taken from local units of government to begin with. Uh, when a local unit, uh, when their uh, tax bills don't reconcile, that is, when they say we think we should have collected this much, but we actually have this much, uh, the state government in its infinite wisdom holds that money on, on behalf of the local unit and doesn't release it until I think we get up to half of their budget. Uh, I had no idea this fund even existed. Uh, but what the bill simply says now is we're going to release $400 million of that money to each unit. Each <coughs> unit gets the money that belongs to it to begin with. Uh, they have to use 75% of that on roads. Uh, and then they had to take 25% and use it for whatever they want. If they want to use that on roads, they can. Now, there was a question last time. Someone thought that it could be used only for asphalt, and that's not so. It can be used however any local unit of government wants to use it, whether that's maintaining equipment, buying equipment, constructing roads, uh, maintaining roads, uh, doing whatever they wish. Uh, the important thing about this bill is we all understand this is a one-time thing. That is a short-term solution. It's not sustainable. When the money from that fund is depleted, it'll take years to, before that's built up enough to be able to do that again, and we all recognize that. It's not a long-term fix. Uh, two proposals for long-term fixes are the, the governor's proposal, which passed the Senate, said we would take everything in the state reserves uh, that's worth over 11.5% of the state budget and, and use that for roads, and it would allow bonding if that was necessary, and that passed the Senate. Uh, the House bill is 1001. Uh, which has come over and had a hearing in front of the Appropriations Committee in the Senate this week, uh, and that would raise uh, a tax on gasoline, I think also a tax on cigarettes, and lower some other taxes. Uh, there was testimony on it, substantial testimony, in the House, or Senate Appropriations Committee, and Senator Hirschman's uh, question was, why would we raise a tax on some things, but then lower a tax on every other need uh, in the state of Indiana? We would be getting more money for roads, but less money for, for virtually everything else. Uh, so I, if I know the, the Appropriations Committee, and I've been before the Appropriations Committee, and those hearings aren't necessarily a lot of fun, uh, if I know the Appropriations Committee, there will be some amendments to this bill. Uh, Senator Kinley amends virtually every bill that comes before his committee. He's chairman of that committee. Uh, so I expect some big changes there. All right, I'll look forward to, to discussing uh, bills with you and taking your questions when, uh, when our time is up. I'll turn it all over to my colleagues from the House. And again, thank you very much for being here. Um, just want to recognize Jesse Bohannon and Michelle Livinghouse. Thank you both for coming out. Um, you guys don't know what you're getting into, do you? <laughs> no, it, it's, it's a true blessing and honor to be a state representative, and, uh, and I wish you both well. Um, you know, <coughs> Randy hit uh, a lot of bills uh, in specifics, and I'm just going to talk about three general subjects. I'll let Bill and uh, Doug talk about some details, perhaps. But uh, Randy talked about the meth bill, and... Uh, 
you know, I think he and, and, and Mr. Webb and, and everyone else involved just did a great job on that because uh, it really is an elegant solution. I think those were Randy's words one time down the um, way back, but uh, it, it really is an opportunity to, to find compromise and, and compromise in this situation was just very good where you have personal liberty and you have uh, law enforcement all sort of uh, maybe happy, maybe not 100% happy, but that, maybe that's what a good compromise is where everybody gets something and, and, and no one gets everything they want. But it's just a great bill uh, and I understand here in Fulton County as, as sort of a laboratory for the state that the meth labs have gone down about 50%. So give Mr. Webb and, and Randy and, and, and everyone else a hand, would you please? I mean, that, that's really a good opportunity. That's really proof that, that staying engaged and, and you don't have to be elected to, to make change in Indiana or, or elsewhere. So that's, that's a testament here for, to Fulton County. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, roads first. There's two bills that worked its way through the House that we gave to the Senate, and they're going to be, um, they gave us a couple bills that we're going to look at too. So we're at the halfway point. So we passed bills, and now the Senate gets to take their turn. Uh, slicing up our bills and, and vice versa. They pass bills and we're going to get a crack at them. Uh, I didn't even have a committee meeting last week because, again, we're at the halfway point and next week we gear up pretty well. And, and Representative Gutwein, he's the chairman of labor and I'm the vice chairman and he's been a, uh, a great friend and, 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 a, and a mentor on that because uh, he's asked me to look through some bills and, uh, and give my two cents on labor. But we're going to be hearing bills in our labor committee next week. We're going to be hearing bills in my other committees. But uh, we only have four weeks left and uh, it's a it's a short session and it's gonna it's gonna go really quick and uh, you know we'll 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 keep you briefed uh, as much as we can after this town hall um, as well. So House Bill 1001 was the main road funding bill, and and in essence it does uh, probably about four or five things uh, that that you may have heard of. It does raise the cigarette tax a dollar. Now keep in mind that's still on the table. That's not a final number. I said in the last town hall that I would like to see that number come down. I think a dollar is probably excessive per pack. Um, perhaps we can find a way just not to raise it at all because I just didn't think smokers should should have to bear the brunt of the hole that's being left in the general fund because what we did was we uh, moved four cents out of every seven cents of sales tax on gasoline from the general fund to roads and by doing that we created about a 280 million dollar hole in the general fund so the thought was we need to plug that hole so let's plug it with a cigarette tax well I just kind of think that perhaps that it could be spread around or maybe we can just find a way to do it out um, another part of the bill uh, it does index gasoline excise tax to inflation that should have been done years ago <laughs> because every five ten years you know the General Assembly had to take an unpopular vote to raise the excise tax well if we left the excise tax um, as originally um, started in 1943 at four cents a, a gallon, you wouldn't have much money to pay for your roads. You'd have maybe 10% of the funds you need to pay for your roads. So it'll, it'll go up uh, according to inflation uh, from here on after. Um, House Bill uh, 1110, that is a bill that's going to infuse to local government $444 million uh, statewide. Uh, my district, uh, District 17, is all of Marshall, most of Fulton. You're scheduled to get back approximately $3.6 million of your money, our money. So we all pay local income taxes, and the state holds on to it and reimburses it back to the counties and so forth. But they kind of hold back just a little bit, and over time it's accumulated about a half a billion dollars, $500 million. But 444 of that 500 is coming back. And it's just sort of like a savings account for local government. So in the bad years, you know, we can pull from that savings account and help the local government with the distribution. But it's your money. Uh, for Rochester, I think it's about a half a million dollars for the cities coming back. You can use it for roads. You can use it for whatever you want. For the county, it's almost a million dollars. It might be a million dollars. Uh, for my county, Marshall County, they get 1.1. But that was a no-nonsense, no-brainer vote. Probably the easiest vote I've ever taken in my life, giving people their money back, right? <laughs> so, so that's what we're going to do for, for roads. And I know the, the final product has not um, come before us. Probably the last week of the session, we're going to vote on a compromise bill. And I think some of the good things in the Senate bill will stick. Some of the good things in the House will stick. Uh, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out on a limb because... Uh, you know, I'm not running for office next year. I am 90.9999% sure that you're going to get a road bill that's going to get more money. And uh, hopefully we can, we can help out with the local roads up here as well from the state. Um, education, I just want to talk about uh, uh, the I-STEP uh, provision that, and, and, and a uh, scholarship bill that we passed. 
So we put to rest I-STEP starting in uh, 2017 school year. Uh, we do have to come up with a, with a test to uh, have some accountability, but for the most part, you know, I think the legislature really listened to people on this one, that, that it's time for I-STEP and testing to go. Um, we're, we're still going to test, of course, but, but we, we're getting the message, and the tone has changed dramatically in the last, I don't know, two, three years. Uh, the federal uh, No Child Left, Beh Left Behind Act has been gutted, and we're still trying to figure out what that means for the states, but uh, some of those testing requirements, from what I understand, were from No Child Left Behind. So there's a big change, not only at the federal level, but at the state level, to, to simplify education and to make it more local. Um, a really good bill that the speaker put forward is try to, to address the uh, teacher shortage. I think it's a great idea. It gives a $7,500 scholarship to the, anyone in the top 20% of the class. Let me, let me qualify that. 200 people a year. It's only 200, but it's about $6 million a year. Um, it'll give them a $7,500 scholarship if they want to go into teaching and they have to teach five years in Indiana. And it's just a, it's a good faith effort also to show that, that we, we, we do like teachers, that we respect teachers, uh, but it's also uh, needed because we are facing in some areas a little bit of shortage. So, so it's an attempt to, to, to probably, again, uh, move the pendulum back into a different direction, but it's also a good, a good faith effort on our part, I think, to really uh, do something for education. Um, you know, that's basically all I have. I'm going to again let Bill and Randy, um, or not Bill and Randy, but uh, Bill and Doug kind of kind of bat uh, clean up here. But I, again, I want to thank everyone for the opportunity to be in the state rep. I want to thank Bill, Bill Friend, for being a friend <laughs> because, because he's uh, been a great mentor and uh, he's, he's local. Uh, he and I butt up uh, on the southeast side of my district. Doug is on the west side of my district and Randy and I share Fulton County or most of Fulton County. And, Randy's got probably a third of Southern Marshall County, and uh, they're really three good legislators, and if Randy goes to the uh, Attorney General, the state will be blessed, and if he doesn't make it, the state's still blessed because uh, he's an outstanding guy, and he's got my support, and I, I went and uh, you know filed for delegates, so there might be some delegate positions available still, and in, 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 uh, I'm gonna plug for Randy, but there might be some delegate positions still available for Fulton County Republicans to, to fill. Uh, I think there's a couple left in Marshall County still left to fill, but I went and filed as a delegate the other day, and I'll, I'll go to the state convention. I'll probably cast my vote for Randy for our next attorney general. So, <laughs> let me qualify that. Let me see how his votes are the next. <laughs> Um, oh, one, one other thing, I'm sorry, there was another bill I wanted to talk about because Mr. Fouts uh, grabbed my attention. Uh, Senate Bill 304 is coming over from the Senate. Um, it's a veterans bill and, and, and um, may, may have just slipped through and, and I, I know the guys over there did not intend to do anything uh, harmful to vets. We love vets. I mean, vets are, vets are up here, you know, we're down there. <laughs> and so we're going to, you know, hopefully take care of that in the House. Uh, uh, we, we don't want any veterans to, to have to um, pay a penalty for, for being disabled, so to speak. So um, uh, maybe the other guys can fill you in on that bill, but uh, trust me, I, I, I know I'm going to speak for myself, though. I'll speak, I should speak for myself. I, I'm, I'm not going to allow that to happen, or at least have a voice on that. So um, I, I've been told the bill is probably you know, going to a place where it's never going to be found again. So um, long story short, I thank you again. I know I'm talking quite a while. I'm going to give Bill and Doug their opportunity, and uh, thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Wow. Ethan, did you get a count for me? Between 90 and 100. Wow. Congratulations, Fulton County. 90 to 100. The four of us are, are very typically uh, in meetings of this uh, 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 subject matter with 15 to 25 folks. Fulton County is just to be congratulated. It's outstanding. When I pulled up here, it was four degrees on my truck and uh, uh, on a Saturday morning before eight o'clock and you know already there was 60 or 70 of you here so i'm very proud of you for participating in your government because that's without participation democracy doesn't work and uh, you are participating and believe me it gets our attention it gets our attention um 
ill friend. Uh, I lived uh, on a farm down uh, by Perrysburg, and uh, we were in a uh, family farm, been there for many years, and uh, uh, one of two active farmers in the House of Representatives, Don Leahy and myself. Don is the chairman of the Ag Committee. I am on the Ag Committee with him, and we try to have a positive influence on uh, the policy, ag policy, uh, as it uh, affects farmers in the state of Indiana. And I just sincerely believe, and it's one of the reasons I go back and, and uh, have filed for election, is that uh, agriculture needs to have a presence and a voice in the General Assembly because it is such a major part of our heritage and our economy. And uh, a lot of our city brethren um, simply don't have the knowledge or the uh, understanding of what it takes to be a farmer these days. The financial burdens, the uh, risk, the uh, market pressures, uh, all of the things that go into it, it's never been easy. If it was easy, everybody would want to do it, and they don't. So, um, a little story. This job get, uh, allows you sometimes to have a, uh, an honor, and, and I occasionally get asked to give a commencement address to a, to a high school, or I've given one to Miami Correctional Facility down at the prison. I've given a couple over at Logansport at the juvenile uh, detention facility, which is on the west side of the state hospital. It's a maximum security uh, place. Uh, when you walk in there, uh, I don't care who you are and what you look like, you empty your pockets, you take off your shoes, and you go through the metal detector, and then they wand you down. And I said, I'm the speaker today. He said, doesn't matter. Get your shoes off. So, um, <laughs> Had a group of about 15 young men. These, these are all young men between 13 and 20 who have, for one reason or another, found themselves in problems. And uh, they are uh, serving a sentence, but at the same time, they're also taking classes. So they're improving their educational stature. And uh, I had given the speech, and it was a typical graduation speech, you know, uh, this is the first day of the rest of your life and you're going to go out there and you're going to learn a skill or a vocation and you're going to improve yourself and participate in society, rah, 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 I just went on and on. The thing was over and we're all standing around shaking hands and this gentleman comes up to me and he's either a father or grandfather, I can't tell. He says, uh, thank you, Representative Friend, for what you had to say. It really helps to motivate these young men, and I appreciate your words and what you had to say. He says, now tell me, tell me, um, in, in real life, is your, is your real job, are you a motivational speaker? And I said, well, sir, in real life, I'm a hog farmer. And he said, you are not. I said, sir, you'd be amazed at the... Uh, similarities between motivating the hogs and motivating the people and i said it's all in where you apply the incentive um, true story true story you've heard about highway funding from from uh, randy and tim folks it's a necessity we have uh, we have screwed down the the county governments and city governments so tightly that uh, it's really difficult for them to have a sustainable program. So House Republicans have come up with this 1001. That's our program. All the other caucuses and the administration have come up with a similar concept or a, a concept that addresses highway funding. And uh, the House version is the only one that is sustainable and ongoing. Randy talked about the one-time fix. The governor or administration plan uh, involves some bonding and borrowing. Folks, I don't, I'm not in favor of maintaining our roads with bonded or borrowed money. All that does is pass the responsibility for paying for those roads on to the next generation of taxpayers. So I'm in favor 
yes, there are some tax increases in what we're doing. The 1001 indexes the gas tax or the sales tax on gasoline back to 2002. That allows for the inflation that has occurred in the last 14 years to be covered. It, it means about a four cent increase in the gas tax. And, and I filled up the truck yesterday and it was a dollar 47. And I would gladly pay another four cents if we didn't have all the potholes, chuck holes, and the crumbling edges on our roads. And I mean state highways and the local roads and streets here in town. The house plan as it stands today would give an immediate 50% increase to local roads, the commissioners, the city council, the mayor, 50%. That's a, that's a huge, huge advantage to get that much money back. Um, this raising the cigarette tax a dollar, uh, I'm, not, I'm not real happy about that at all. I'm not happy about it at all. Just be real honest. House District 23 uh, is termed a low income district. Um, our, Per capita income uh, is about half of what it is in Hamilton County. And the experts will tell you that smoking follows income, which would mean that the 24% uh, of Hoosiers who smoke, probably in House District 23, it's, it's much higher than that 24%, probably closer to 30 to 35%, <coughs> which means House District 23 would be paying uh, a more a higher percentage uh, than they would be paying in the more affluent districts. Uh, so I'm not happy about that. But on the other, the other side of that coin is this dollar on cigarettes is going to be dedicated back to the Medicaid appropriation. That Medicaid appropriation coincides with that uh, 280 to 300 million dollars that uh, 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 is dedicated. Uh, to Medicaid in the state budget. That's how we got to that number. Uh, the Medicaid appropriation and several of the folks who are low income smokers end up using the Medicaid program. So it's, that's the logic that's involved. Uh, as I said, I don't care for the uh, increase in the cigarette tax, but uh, um, we're living in the real world folks and this House Bill 1001 is sustainable. Uh, there are some other factors in 1001 that uh, may or may not affect us. There is uh, 100 million set aside that a, a local community could, ap could apply for uh, if they have a specific project, like a main street improvement or a, a, a bridge that needed uh, replacement. They could apply for that money and NDOT would review and the budget committee would review and you could possibly get some of that $100 million, which comes out of the surplus funds. I believe we need to help our highways and our local roads. And I appreciate Farm Bureau being on support of helping us with our local roads and our construction projects because we need it. And uh, uh, I think we would all agree, those in the ag community, that uh, the farm trucks and the semis that use our roads certainly could use uh, heavier highways and, and those repairs could be made. Um, education, education every year is a, lot, a long list or a litany of, of uh, uh, legislation that we work on. The one bill I'll talk about is 1004. I got a lot of comments about 1004 from the teachers who didn't like it. 1004 um, deals with three things. Um, first one was Pension requirements for new teachers does not have an effect on teachers who have some seniority. It is beginning teachers and, and it cuts the time limit from 10 years down to five for qualifications. And, and uh, so uh, that's issue number one. Number two was uh, the superintendent's ability to pay a little extra for a hard to fill position. And I'm by that, what's a hard to fill position? Well, it might be a physics teacher, a chemistry teacher, a senior math teacher, French, German, Spanish, anything out here 
uh, in rural Indiana that might be a hard to fill position. If that superintendent needed to pay an extra three to $5,000 to get a teacher, he would be allowed to do that. Some of the folks wrote in and, and, and said, well, we can already do that, it's in our contract. The necessity comes from a court decision in Jay County that disallowed that. So the, the statute needs to be adjusted. And then finally, there was a, a portion of the bill that deals with reciprocity, reciprocal agreements. Uh, a teacher who is licensed in Illinois or Ohio, this adjusts the reciprocal agreement so that the superintendent has more ability to bring in qualified teachers. That's what it's all about. It's absolutely no knock on, on education here locally. Um, veterans bill, uh, Senate Bill 304. I had no idea it was a it was so dangerous, but um, last week I had a message from Jay Kendall. Many of you might know Jay Kendall in Miami County, the veteran service officer. And Jay had sent me a message, and then I just happened to run into him at the bank on Friday, and we had a really good discussion. I told him I would talk with uh, the folks at Ways and Means. Chairman Brown, Chairman Tim Brown of Crawfordsville assured me that uh, Senate Bill 304 is gonna undergo some major changes and adjustments because of the uh, pushback that they have been receiving uh, from the veterans groups. And uh, um, I understand my old classmate, high school classmate, Rick Fouts is your new veteran service officer up here. And uh, Rick is gonna hopefully have an opportunity to make a statement on this uh, subject matter here in a few minutes. Um, <laughs> told you I'm on the Ag Committee. Uh, much of our time has been about chicken or poultry inspection. Poultry inspection. Um, if you raise between 1,000 and 20,000 birds, um, those birds can be farm processed, slaughtered and processed, and sold to, the end, to an end user. You can do that with uh, uh, an exemption from the federal and the state department. There's a, there's a four-star restaurant in northeastern Indiana that is buying chicken from a farm not far from here. That chicken is uninspected and it is being prepared at the restaurant and sold with no inspection. That has rankled the feathers of many people. Um, I can assure you that a hog farmer or a cattle farmer or a sheep farmer, any meat that they would sell if it was going through a restaurant, it had to be inspected. Those chickens, and this farm is doing about 8,000 a year, most of, which, most of them are going through that restaurant, that fine restaurant, and they object to the inspection process. And so it comes to the legislature and we have to deal with it. I understand the bill has passed that they have to be inspected. Uh, it is in the Senate. I understand that there is a uh, compromise being, being worked out. I'm not sure what that can be. Um, we'll see. Beef farmers, uh, the Beef Council has, has agreed to a, low, a state $1 checkoff. There is already a federal checkoff of $1, so now if this proceeds, uh, every time a calf or a cow is sold, there would be $2 deducted for the Beef uh, Association. So that would be if it's sold as a newborn, if it's sold as a feeder calf, if it is sold as a finished steer, each time that animal is sold, there'd be two bucks go to the Beef Council. Um, we also discuss industrial hemp, trying to make industrial hemp a, a, another crop that's possible for farmers in Indiana to grow. Purdue is undergoing 
uh, uh, research program. And then um, uh, there is the oil that is derived, so there are some health benefits. We uh, certainly have some disagreements on in that situation. Um, I'm also on the environmental committee, and you may have read that there is a, a bill that's passed called No More Stringent. No More Stringent. And uh, Representative Walkins from over at Warsaw is chairman of the committee, and he's had this bill every year for several years. And uh, he does not want the state of Indiana to be able to put into place any rules or regulations that are more stringent than would come down from EPA. And uh, he always draws the ire of the uh, environmental groups, and uh, uh, it thus far has, has had trouble in the Senate and, and never seen the light of day. But uh, no more stringent comes from the fact that he doesn't want um, a bureauc bureaucracy <coughs> Regardless of who the governor would be, he does not want a bureaucracy in place with bureaucrats who would be able to uh, put more stringent regulations on industry, farms, and uh, that's the purpose for the bill. <coughs> One more thing, House Bill 1110, it's, it's our version of the House version of returning your money to you, the uh, option income tax that is held in reserves by the state of Indiana, 1110. Um, we would give that money back to the local governments with no strings attached. So those local governments would be able to use that, that money for streets, bridges, highways, whatever, wherever their uh, position of need might be. Um, I'm gonna stop and look forward to your questions and uh, Great that you're all here. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you for coming. If I hear any more about the chicken bill, I'm going to go home and take my mattress off the bed and sleep on the slats. This has been going on for quite some time. Uh, I do need, to make, do need to make an apology for what I said at the last meeting about Planned Parenthood. Uh, probably I should have reworded that, so if I offended anybody, I apologize. But I will never change my position on the unborn children. They should be a protected class, and I will always support those people. Uh, my attire today, uh, I've been married about 35 years and around the Gutwein household. When I come out of the shower, whatever's hanging on the hook that my wife put there, I put on and leave the house. There's no questions about what I'm going to wear. So I think it's kind of a message about what tomorrow is going to be. <laughs> Senator Head, uh, it was a pleasure to listen to him. I sat along the sidelines when he was presenting his bill uh, in the House on, on, on the uh, drug problems we have here. Frankly, it's embarrassing with the meth labs that we have. We're number what, Randy, in the, in the country? One. Number one. And if they have programs out there in other states that are working, we should have been on top of this a long time ago. So thank you and, and, and Smaltz for what you're doing. It's, it's, uh, it's going to be really cool. Uh, a couple things, and I won't go all along here. There was a bill uh, that came to committee the Labor Committee about uh, the age of 85, okay? If, you, if you're a state uh, employee or uh, a teacher, you can retire at the age and years of service at 85. Well, there was a bill came by uh, changing it to 95. I heard some moans. <laughs> you want to talk on this? No. <laughs> that came to my committee, and uh, I, I probably threw it on a pile to the side. Uh, I got 1,200 emails from teachers who opposed this. Well, I, should, I probably should have got out in front of it. I got a call from uh, the lobbyist people, and I said, I am not going to hear that bill. If you're going to do something like that, you don't do it at the end of somebody's career. You would do it at the beginning and set up some kind of a program. And I'm not sure 95 is a good number, but we are not going to hear uh, the rule of 95. And I told the lobbyist, I said, you know, when I do something you don't like, you don't have a problem sending emails out. So I said, how about when I do something you do like, you send the same email out? Well, I got 2,000 thank yous on not hearing the, the rule of 95. Uh, House Bill 1004, the bill touched on, uh, I voted against it. There was, there was collective bargaining in it, uh, there was pensions, and the last time I checked, I'm the chairman 
of employment, labor, and pensions. You see my frustration. I have a feeling I know why it didn't come to my committee because last year I refused to hear a Senate bill on collective bargaining. It just wasn't right, so I refused to hear it. Uh, so that's my position on uh, 1004. Whether you like it or not, I really don't care. Uh, we, what we are doing, uh, we are doing the 13th check again. Uh, we have a hearing on Wednesday. On uh, the 13th check this year, Chairman Brown, Ways and Means, uh, amended into the bill $20,700,000 to make the, the, the fund whole. The money was coming from the amnesty tax program, which there seems to be like $170-some million in. Um, that's going to be a positive for us, and that will probably pass out with uh, uh, unanimous votes. Veterans, the veterans, a lot of veterans are here. Thank you guys for your service. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you guys are as old as I am, but, but thank you so much for what you've done and what you're doing in the legions of the VFWs. I have a bill 1312 that's going to the Veterans Affairs Committee passed out of the out of the House uh, unanimously, and what it does, it's a veteran-owned business, okay? You can apply for certification, and right now, the way the rules are, you have to, we were piggybacking our certification on the federal government certifications, and these veterans that are starting businesses really don't want to fool with the federal government. I can't imagine why, but, but we're, we're going to change this. Uh, that bill is going to go to Veterans Affairs in uh, Senator Banks' committee, uh, probably not well when I ask him <laughs> let, let me go on down the list a little bit further Senate bill 362 is Senator Banks's bill it's coming to my committee it has to do with with uh, changing the age of people who have been in the military uh, if they're in the medical field uh, if they were if they were uh, MP had, had law enforcement uh, fire they worked in the fire protection in the army when they get out there was a kind of an age limit on when they could get it going to work in the private sector uh, without taking additional, tr without retraining. So this has been changed, it was changed last year where they, they raised the age, and that's what they're trying to do again, is raise the age up to 42, don't quote me on I believe 42 of these guys and gals could get into the private sector with the training they had in the military. So, I go to Senator Banks, and I said, when are you going to give my veteran-owned business a hearing? And he said, well, probably next week. And I said, but by the way, I said, your bill coming to my committee, uh, there's another bill that has some of the same language, so we are going to amend your bill into that one. And he says to me, well, I may have to rethink giving your bill a hearing. So when we get back down there Monday, we've got to do some amending and try to get everybody on the same page. Uh, I, I had about four calls on, on Senate Bill 162, and everybody talked on that. Randy, you might be able to help me on this. It was about immunizations uh, in hospitals, where some of the nurses are going to be required, if the hospital says so, take some different kind of immunization shots uh, for a condition of employment. It has not been scheduled for a hearing yet, and, and, and God, I hope it's not scheduled for a hearing. That will create a firestorm. So they've already talked about 304. So with that, uh, I'm finished. So we'll probably take questions. Thank you. Thank you.